Right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Evolution of Galarian panel. This is where we're talking about how some elements of the setting have evolved from when we first put out the Inner Sea World Guide a decade ago. Um, but first, we're going to start with some introductions. I'm Adam Daigle. I'm the managing developer at Paizo. I'm Luis Loza. I'm one of the Pathfinder developers. Uh, I'm Eleanor Fair, and I'm one of the other Pathfinder developers. And to her left is the book that both of them worked very, very hard on. <laughs> right? Want to take it away, Luis? Yeah, OK. Um, so if you're accustomed, if, you, if you've played with our setting before and our setting, you know that we have several different countries and, and regions in, in the world. We have Chaliax and Numeria and Varicia and the Longy Expanse, and there's a lot of, of different places. Uh, and the nature of this book, The Lost Domains World Guide, uh, available at the end of this month, uh, will go into all of those regions as well. But uh, instead of presenting them one by one, uh, what we did is we broke up the, the inner sea region here on this wonderful map into 10 different meta regions that kind of keep everything on theme or, or uh, several nations that are close by, keep them all together into nice big clusters that are easier to uh, uh, go off of and, and work with. And I think what we're going to do is just kind of talk about each of these regions and then maybe explain how things have changed since maybe last time you saw them in print in uh, the Inner Sea World Guide. So if we go to our first slide, I think we can talk to you about our first region, uh, which is Absalom, the, you know, the biggest city in the, or the Inner Sea, in the, known as the uh, city as the center of the world, the jewel of the Inner Sea region. Uh, a place that we actually haven't explored much in our adventure paths or modules, but we have explored a lot in Pathfinder, Society, Organized Play, things like that. Uh, and you know, it's still big Absalom. Uh, big changes regarding Absalom are uh, recently there, through the Organized Play scenarios, there was a, a shaking up uh, of the economy in the fact that suddenly slavery is outlawed. You can't have slaves there anymore. Um, what other big stuff was going on there? Several oh. sieges. <laughs> yeah, several sieges. Uh, most recently, there was an attempted siege on it by one terrible, terrible man, the, the Whispering Tyrant, Tarbifan, a, a lich who has, become, who has been freed and is now rampant and, and running around doing terrible things that liches tend to do. Uh, if we want to go to the next slide here. I'm just showing off a bit of Absalom. This is a, a view from the docks. Absalom, if, if you're used to seeing it in our adventures and whatnot, is still pretty much the same. Uh, some other stuff has started happening along the way here. Uh, most recently, there's been a, a group of dis several displaced goblins who have since taken residence in the Puddles district uh, of Absalom. And make perfect goblins to work with as new player characters if you're planning to play with the second edition rules that have goblins as a core ancestry. Um, what else has happened? Oh, I mean, there's political intrigue going on in Absalom and things like that. Uh, the, the kind of cool stuff you expect in cities and, and would get from urban campaigns. I think we have one more Absalom picture here. Yes, there it is. The Starstone Cathedral, the big place where uh, you can go and perhaps, if you're lucky and, and uh, skilled enough, become a deity yourself. There is a, a titular starstone, which is somewhere deep within the, the bowels of the starstone cathedral that if you touch it and succeed at the test of the starstone, like a few others have before uh, you, if you make it, uh, you could become a deity in a sense to, to divinity. So, uh, if we want to go on to our next region here, that is the intro in our book here. Each of our regions has a nice big cool intro page that if you've been following our blogs, you've been seeing here and uh, seeing some of this artwork. But this is uh, the intro to the Broken Lands. What's going on in the Broken Lands? Or... Well, uh, uh, those of you who have seen the Adventure Pass Wraths of the Righteous uh, and played through it, um, if you haven't played through it, spoilers, cover your ears. But uh, the, by the way, there's going to be a lot of spoilers here talking about adventure paths and modules. And stuff. The world wound, which was a giant rip in the earth that opened into the abyss and spewed out a billion demons, uh, was closed. But the, um, 
And in the process, um, they they drove back a lot of the demons, but there's still about a million of them there. Um, so now there is a fight going on to reclaim that land, especially by the people who once lived there and were driven out and mostly murdered by said demons. Um, there is a small problem at that the lich that we talked about, Tarbifon, is going and doing awful lichy things down to the south, which means that a lot of the crusaders who helped shut the world wound have left to go fight the lich in his uh, terrible lichy war. So it's a perfect place for new player characters, new heroes to rise up to, to help out. If we want to go to the next slide here. I think, uh, you know, the Broken Lands has a lot of exciting things going on, including uh, the land of Numeria, which is where a giant starship fell thousands of years ago, and since then things have been pouring out, like these robots here. Uh, so if you've ever been interested in, you know, getting a laser gun for your fighter or, or power armor for your wizard, that's the place to go to. <laughs> and we recently had an adventure path set there as well, uh, called the Iron Gods Adventure Path, and that culminated with uh, the ascension of a new deity who is just rising up and getting to be known throughout Numeria, uh, known as Cassandali. And, uh, Thing, technology marches on and is on the rise thanks to, to her help. Uh, if we want to go to the next slide here, and that's the, uh, the Silver Mount. That's where the starship crashed there. Um, I think what else is going on in the Broken Lands? There was the River Kingdoms where if a new kingdom was born via uh, the Kingmaker Adventure Path, which we don't really discuss too much in our new uh, book here because we don't know what players and different tables ended up with for their uh, adventure pass. You know, there's a kingdom there, and you can definitely go and take your own plot of land, make your own, make the land your own uh, there with that. Uh, and there's also and by to add to that, yeah. like by keeping that vague, it allows everyone who actually pay, played through the Kingmaker Adventure Path to imagine that the, their player characters are the ones running their nation that they customize throughout mm -hmm. the course of probably two years of playing through yeah. that adventure path. Or, and we didn't want to like diminish the results of y'all's games by putting something definitive in print of mm -hmm. the name of this kingdom is this and ruled by these people. So leaving space for GMs and for groups to continue to customize our setting. Uh, or if you happen to spend 120 hours on your computer playing the Kingmaker computer game <laughs> as well. Uh, I think we can then hop on to our next region, uh, Spooky Town. Known as the, the Eye of Dread, which is the ground zero for Tarbifon's armies and, and his recent uh, liberation from his prison uh, of Galaspire. Uh, this is the, the region where, typically in an RPG campaign setting, there's bad stuff going on all the time. This is very bad stuff all the time. Uh, there are roaming armies of undead uh, just everywhere there used to be a land here known as last wall which was completely founded to just guard that one prison i mentioned they failed and they paid for it and now they're a region known as the gravelands because it's overrun with undead uh and mutated animals and plants and it's not, not a place i'd recommend going uh so if we want to go to our next slide here uh we have a new ruler in the Eye of Dread, who uh, came about with the Iron Fang, uh, oh gosh, Iron Fang Invasion. Iron Fang Invasion Adventure Path. Thank you. I obviously can't remember. So maybe Eleanor. <laughs> Not only just a new ruler, but a new nation. A new nation as well. Yeah. Uh, so Iron Fang Invasion is when a bunch of hobgoblins, led by General Azerzi, um, decided that they were going to take advantage of Molthun's no questions asked, we'll give you a bunch of weapons um, policy, which is historically in the real world worked out really well for everybody who does that. Um, so they took all of those weapons and basically invaded the neighboring country of Nirmathus and some of Molthun and caused a real big mess and were not very nice and eventually were routed by the Nirmathus militia and the heroes who were in command of it. Now, in that adventure, you can kill her, but you can also talk her into leaving in peace. And this, in this particular adventure path, 
uh, we decided that the heroes there talked her into peace. Um, whether or not that's a good thing is up for debate. Uh, it's still an army of hobgoblins who do horrible things. People are still wondering if she, uh, that is General Azerse, just retreated to build up her army again and just invade again. Um, on the other hand, there's a lich in the area, and he is not really um, diplomatizable. <laughs> so, for the most part, people are not paying attention to the hobgoblins. In fact, some of the more optimistic diplomats are kind of hoping the hobgoblins might help them fight the Whispering Tyrant. Because hobgoblins like to fight, um, and how that winds up, we'll just have to see. I think that's a good time to talk about having to make the decisions yeah, about different APs. Um, yeah, making this book was very interesting um, in a number of ways. One of the things is like we got to, we were able to like kind of snap everything to the current. Uh, all of our adventure paths have always been assumed to have started in the corresponding year, calendar year to when they came out. Um, so there were a lot of things that were 10 years old that we never fully gave a real resolution to. So in the build-up to this book, we had many, many multiple hour meetings <laughs> where we went through and we had adventure paths up on the whiteboard and we talked about, hey, okay, what was the result of this? And we kind of, and we had a large group, it was you know, almost all of the creative team and everyone got to throw out ideas of, no, I think it should have went like this. Some of it was a little debate since a lot of them were just like, yep, we all agree. That's probably how that should have worked. But something else that we did even before going through each of the adventure paths and a number of the modules that had more important ramifications is um, we kind of talked about the setting in general, like real, you know, deep dive, look at ourselves type things. Like, what are some things we really like about the setting? What are some things we really don't like about us, the setting? What are some things where we might have made bad decisions back in 2009 that we can now fix in 2019? Um, and that was extra exciting because this, the number of people in our creative team had doubled since that time. So we had a lot more different voices, a lot more different ideas, and almost all of us that had come past when Pathfinder first started a decade ago, we'd been playing in the setting. We had our own games, and so we could kind of like say, well, this is how it came when we played through this AP. This is how this happened, yeah. and that helped feed some of that narrative that we have in the Lost Omens world. I want to hit our next slide here. Uh, hey, look, it's the Gravelands. Don't go there. Uh, <laughs> it's overrun. It's undead. It's got, if you can see, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a lot of kind of mutated, weird-looking, gross animals and plants there. So it's just kind of the fallout that happens when a lich breaks free and decides, I, I want to become a god and take over the world. Uh, let's go on to our next region here which is uh, the Golden Land. Uh, golden the Golden Road. Road, sorry, excuse me. It is a Golden Land, known as a Golden Road, uh, that uh, kind of occupies the northern half of the southern continent of uh, our inner sea region, which is known as Groon. Which is, you know, confusing. The northern half, which is kind of our analog to things like Egypt and some of the Middle East and Northern Africa, things like that. Uh, we have different nations here, like the nation of Katapesh, which is a land of Great Mercantile and Assyrian, which is just ancient Egypt, uh, <laughs> stuff like that. But uh, there, there have been uh, a few adventure, one for sure adventure path that I can recall off the top of my head that uh, took place in the region, which was in Katapesh particularly, which was our last 3.5 adventure path, uh, the Legacy of Fire. And one thing we wanted to make sure when we went in to decide some of these adventure paths uh, you know how these turned out. We didn't always just want to say everything was hunky dory, 100%. Everything turned out happy, and now there's nothing wrong with the world ever again. Because one that leaves a kind of boring, uninteresting world where there's nothing left to do, or you know, if you need to play your character to go save the world, if the world's already saved, and well, why do I adventure? I can finally be a farmer and be safe. Um, so some of the things we decided is just the degree of success that players would have ended up with. Uh, and in particular, this is one, one that I was trying to push for myself, and having developed the book, I could actually let that happen. Uh, with the end of Legacy of Fire, there was a chance that uh, the big villain, the Ifridi Jabul, could have become one of the living 
spawn of Rovagug, which is our god of chaos and destruction and is looking to just eat the world entirely and you know then go on and go do terrible things and i we kind of ended up on he was very close and he actually awakened partially awakened the spawn of Rovagug, and it's there and now it's kind of breathing harder and, and faster like it's looking to wake up pretty soon so you have stopped him and technically the world is okay for now but that that thing is still kind of there. there there's a chance that you know next time someone tries to wake it up it'll finally wake up and you can go 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 have to deal with that if we want to go to our next slide here oh this is uh a nice little oasis for the sun orchid elixir uh our one of our nations here is the land of thuvia which is especially known for the creation of the sun orchid elixir when you drink it hey you revert back to a young age and effectively if you can keep getting hold of this stuff you are immortal because you just become young again um, and that's one of the oases is where they uh, find this rare orchid that they use in the process of this. Um, I don't remember what. Where's another like? Yes, uh, mummy's mask. Mummy's mask. That's yep. the other. Uh, one. Yeah. Um, so one thing I regret about the slide before this one is it does not show the uh, pyramid, which is in the distance from uh, the giant beetle. That pyramid wasn't there before. Um, <laughs> so there was the. Um, a certain pharaoh woke up and decided that he was just going to take back over ruling Assyria. And, and um, you know, nobody was actually very thrilled with that because he was like an undead monstrosity. Yeah, yeah mummies aren't fun. Yeah, mummies aren't really fun. Um, and he added like a bunch of flying pyramids, and one of them landed in the city of uh, Sothis and spewed out a bunch of mummies and other undead creatures. And that was when the Ruby Prince of Assyrian decided that adventurers were not allowed to go investigate tombs full of mummies anymore. And um, <laughs> you need to get a, a bigger license for that now. You, you can like get uh, maybe some grandfathered in things that the Pathfinder Society has because they negotiated with the Ruby Prince himself. But um, yeah. That hasn't really stopped adventurers from going in there because they're full of money and also because the people who live next to the pyramid that's still full of undead monstrosities don't really enjoy that. It's wrecking the property values and so they sort of under the table hire adventurers to go in there and maybe murder all the undead so it's safe to live there again. Um, but yeah, um, that's just sort of another uh, way of how you know, we saved we saved a Syrian from the sky pharaoh, but it didn't quite go all hunky dory like. Yeah, in addition to the pyramid that fell on Sothis, a dozen others fell throughout the nation. So there's all of these nice little uh, reinvigorated hot spots. Let's go on to our last slide here. Oh, this is the uh, hanging city. The hanging city of Teskra. I just grabbed art. That's cool. Uh, I mean, it's full of automatons. Why don't you talk about automatons, Luis? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, specifically automatons are a specific type of construct that uh, were designed thousands of years ago by the ancient empire of Jiska, where in order to make these cool robots to fight and protect their nation, they kind of downloaded themselves into these automatons and shortly thereafter their nation kind of died out and now there's a bunch of these automatons walking around which are kind of infused with the souls and, and, and minds of people uh, and have been doing so for thousands of years they're pretty much are one of our most powerful constructs that exist in the setting at this point they some of them are highly intelligent beings that have been around and plotting for thousands of years and knows what they're up to i sure actually don't know <laughs> um yeah but they're showing off the some of like the different um when you think of things like ancient egypt and stuff you, you know there's a lot of images that come to mind but we also like to add interesting twists to that kind of stuff so you know hey here's these this ancient egyptian land that actually had flying cities and, and flying pyramids it, it's just a bit different making it that more pathfinder galarian uh take on some of this stuff so what is our next region? Oh, it's the high seas. Everyone loves pirates, I think. So we got to have a pirate land. 
And uh, this is showing off some of the free captains of the, the shackles in the high seas region, which kind of constitutes everything that is the ocean along the western coast of our inner sea region. And there was an adventure path here. If you played the uh, Skull and Shackles adventure path, you might know that uh, the free captains all are under the com they, 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 they all look up to and kind of are under the command of a figure known as the Hurricane King, who uh, by the end of that adventure path is no longer around. Instead, we have a new Hurricane Queen by the name of Tessa Fairwind, and she looking to shake things up just a bit and get more into that fun piracy stuff that everyone loves to do. Uh, I forget what our next slide is, so we'll see it now. Oh, yeah. Uh, one, one thing we went into with the high seas here is there's a lot to do with the ocean, and if looking at the map, it just takes up so much space, but there's not a lot of dots on the map that we can really point to and say, oh, go here, go here, beyond scattered islands. So what we wanted to add were uh, different underwater cities. We have aquatic elves and other uh, underwater-bound uh, beings that we, we uh, have in our game. So we created, for example, a brand new wholesale uh, underwater city. This is Irem, uh, the, the land of the uh, one of the aquatic elves settlements here and it's cool they have big bugs that they kind of herd around that one has a nice cute scarf so you know that it's a good friendly bug <laughs> uh, and you know just adding more interesting adventuring sites beyond just here's another dungeon here's another you know, place in the middle of a forest here's another mountain to climb going underwater i think is something that we don't tend to do too much partially because the rules make it kind of a pain but we just want to add more interesting sites for people to, to work with. And I think our third slide here is a very interesting site. I don't think you want to end up here. This is the Crimson Citadel, headquarters of an organization known as the Red Mantis Assassins, who uh, are very good at their job and would prove <laughs> that if you ever made it here. Um, they live on a, an island all to themselves, Meteogalti Island, which is... Uh, out in the middle of the ocean and the only place you can ever learn to be a red man's assassin is by coming here uh, hopefully by invitation uh, but you know anyone could te technically become an assassin and they can end up being anywhere and are a uh, great figure for uh, uh, villains uh, of any kind of adventure or if you wanted to run an evil adventure they're actually the perfect kind of organization that you'd hop into and, and get to go do cool stuff with so uh, we talk about a uh, Mediogalti island in the, the region here and talk a little bit about the uh, Red Mantis assassins. And in this book in particular, we actually have new character options for every region. And the one for the High Seas region is the Red Mantis assassin archetype. So if you wanted to play one of those or use those in your game, you can look into the section and grab uh, the dedication feats, become one of those as early as level two if you were so inclined and if your GM lets you. Uh, so our next region here, it's cool, it's the Impossible Lands, as we call them. The, a lot of stuff going on in the Impossible Lands. This is uh, an image of Iswan, the capital of Jelmeray, an island that's kind of a, at least a, a touch, a, a bit of uh, Indian mythology and stuff going on here. Uh, the Impossible Lands have... I think the most disparate like themes going on yeah. at once and undead nation nation of super, super magic power wizards yeah and uh, if we go to the next slide uh, there's uh, on the next slide here we'll see that there's just guns in in the region as well um, Param or Lauren could we get the next slide there we go uh, Hey, look, automatons. Automatons, hey. Uh, guns are in the game here, but they're kind of isolated to the, the mana waste specific region in the uh, Impossible Land. So if you want guns, you go there. If you don't want guns, you don't let your players go there. <laughs> and you know, lots of cool stuff going on here. And I think our last image is of, ah, uh, yes, the uh, Monastery of the Unblinking Flame, which is one of the places you can go and actually take one of the cool archetypes to learn new martial arts styles and stuff perfect for monks but anyone can can join up and based on themes of each of the monasteries has a different elemental themes it's obviously the fire one uh don't think there was much going on in terms of ap's yeah. around here there was an adventure 
Uh, that, set in the Mana Waste. Yeah, Impossible Lands we really kind of didn't... We never really got a chance to get around to, so hopefully we can going forward. But are there any big changes that we can think of? No, it's, I mean, still Undead Nation, still Super Magic, still Gun, yeah. so come by. Maybe we'll, we'll start shaking things up soon. The difference is Arasne's not hanging out in Gap oh, yes. anymore. It was uh, the Red Queen that she was once known, Arasne, now the Unyielding. She's a, a former herald of a, a god in the land, and, or the region, and was raised as a lich and has since broken free and is now on her own doing who knows what. <laughs> I think Eleanor will want to talk about our next region in the next slide here. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the next region here we have is the Mwangi Expanse, which is another place uh, we never really got to as much as we wanted to. Uh, hopefully that's going to change. We've definitely shaken things up a little more in this area. Um, this would be the uh, city of Nantambu, which is sort of central in the lower regions of the uh, jungle of the Mwangi Expanse. Um, it is the oldest magical academy in the Inner Sea region. Um, it was founded by Old Mage Jatembe, who is the person who brought magic back after Earthfall, which is when a giant meteor hit and everything sucked for a really long time, and everyone sort of went back to... <laughs> caveman era technology but old mage Jatembe came back and learned some magical secrets and founded this university and it's still here to this day um and they have an interesting technique that other people haven't really managed yet they like to blend schools of magic uh, in particular, they like to blend primal magic which is sort of nature magic and arcane magic which is Typical wizard magic. <laughs> wizard stuff. <laughs> uh, they like to blend those traditions together. Still working on blending other traditions like occult magic and uh, what's the fourth one? Divine. 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 Still working on those, um, but they're pretty well known for the blend of primal and arcane. I'm going to hit our next slide here. Yeah, um, so... There were two nations known as Illyrgin and Sirgava, uh, and then Eredin died and ruined everything. And part of what he ruined was a giant hurricane opened up uh, on the ocean. You probably, you might know it from the high seas since that's where it's more visible. And the pirates from the shackles like to hide out in there because nobody really wants to go into a hurricane. Um, but that hurricane also totally swamped the two coastal nations around the place. And um, so s the remnants of those cultures have been sort of living out in sucky swamp land for a hundred years. Um, a bunch of them went to a city known as Jaha and were sort of being kind of weird and proclaiming doom. And a bunch of the leaders committed suicide for some reason. Uh, so eventually the remainder and a bunch of their lizard folk friends went over to that city to ask them, you know, what was up and found that everyone had vanished. Um, so they have decided to set up a new city outside of the old city because they do not want to live in the place where everyone mysteriously vanished and are uh, sort of rebuilding their culture while investigating just what the heck happened. So... Um, some of you may have heard that Lizard Folk is going to be a new playable ancestry in the second book in this line, which is the Lost Omens character guide. So that would be a great place for you to play somebody from the Mwangi Expanse or a Lizard Folk exploring mysteries of unknown varieties. Oh, as Eleanor mentioned, we haven't had many APs actually centered in the Mwangi Expanse, but we have made changes there and there's been some stuff that touched upon it specifically, like the Serpent Skull Adventure Path, where there's a point where you go into the uh, city of Usaro and face the being known as the Gorilla King, and since then it turns out, hey, PCs fought him and won, and he's dead, and now it's shaking things up. But we didn't want to fully just have to only make changes via Adventure Paths and modules. In fact, one thing that we did here is, is the former nation Sargava, which is originally a, a kind of an offshoot of the 
Nation of Chelyax became its own thing and has since then been over the 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 people there were overthrown by the locals and they remade the nation into the nation of Vidrian which is now a fresh new young uh nation just a few years old by the point that this book is set uh and they're you know just a new place that shows that the world is changing still and things are happening even when PCs aren't directly involved uh, and it just it shows that the, the world is still alive yeah. uh, and we have one more slide here. There's uh, the flying cities <laughs> of the Wangi Expanse. This is the no longer no flying, longer flying city. city. Uh, <laughs> the crash of city. Uh, you can see the ruins of this flying city. And this is a place where there's lots of cool, interesting magic and technology. And it is, uh, again, another fun twist of the, what we try to do in Pathfinder here. Give different things that you would expect in some place that has uh, inspiration from African mythology and stuff like well. They also had crazy flying cities here. It's pretty cool. Uh, trying to get through these last few areas here pretty quick. Uh, next region uh, is the Old Cheliax region, uh, named after the prominent nation of Cheliax, where we've actually had three different adventure paths set in it. Uh, the most recent ones were the biggest shakeup there are Hell's Rebels and Hell's Vengeance adventure path, in that uh, the... the um, I think it was district. I forgot what the exact name of the county of uh, Ravenel. Ah, ba yes. Basically, uh, there was a, a rebellion, Hell's Rebels, uh, that seceded from Cheliax, and at the same time, other the Glorious Reclamation, a group of paladins and other um, crusaders, tried to take over the capital city. And in that, you played evil uh, evil PCs and stopped them from doing that because these good guys. What are they trying to do? We got to you know, swat them out of here. Uh, and in turn, Chelyax has been uh, pretty shaken up. I'm going to hop to our next slide here. Uh, and not only were they shaken up by that, with the uh, Tarp Bafan's uh, armies marching around, they started slowly seeping their way into the land of Isgur. Luckily, no one knows the, the forest in that region better than the goblins who live there. And it turns out that they are actually the lesser of the evils here and pretty good at fighting back against undead. So they've been able to keep the undead at bay thanks to uh, their wonderful, wonderful pyrotechnics. Because uh, undead still burn. <laughs> Somebody on the forums wrote a little goblin song for burning the undead. Um, <laughs> I wish that I remember it now, yeah. but it's, it's definitely, it ended with weeby goblins, you stay dead. Um, so that might be a little chant for you to look up if you want to play a goblin in this area. <laughs> and our next slide will show the uh, wonderful city of Cantargo, which is where the Hell's Rebels and Venture Path really started, and that's where the, the Flames of Rebellion were first banned. And uh, it's now kind of its own wonderful jewel of Ravenel, but we'll see uh, how things turn out for the new nation as we hop over to probably our most explored region, the Saga Lands. Uh, and this slide depicts some big spoilers from the end of one of our more recent APs, the Return of the Rune Lords AP, which spoilers some Rune Lords Return in that. And with that, uh, <laughs> some of the uh, one of the ancient cities from ancient Thassalon was, which was actually turns out time locked and kind of stuck and frozen in time, uh, broke free. The the PCs kind of broke that lock, and it's now a. Uh, here and there are people that were displaced from 10,000 years ago that are now living in the region uh, of Saga Lands, which includes you know, our big nation of Arisia, uh, big frontier region of Arisia, it's not a proper nation, but it also includes uh, Irisin, which is the land of uh, eternal winter, kind of ruled over by Baba Yaga and her, her uh, several daughters. It's another place we explored in our Reign of Winter AP. Uh, and hop on, yeah, oh, there it is, yes. Uh, a place where, you know, big, Dancing huts will kind of sneak up on you if you're not careful and stomp you and uh, make sure you stay out of the, the nation. Uh, it, with that AP, there's been a change in rulership. Uh, instead of having Baba Yaga come in and place another one of her daughters, uh, to PCs, we make the assumption, of course, you can make all these changes in your game it's as, as you like, but we make the assumption that the PCs take uh, her... Uh, Great great granddaughter from some far off land known as Russia uh, that became the new queen uh, of Irisin, and now she's turns out a lot less cruel than uh, the previous queens. 
you know, maybe she, she will change things up for the good, but there's a lot of people who aren't a fan of that. Yeah, when the rest of the aristocracy are kind of jerks, um, one good person has their work cut out for them. Yeah. And, uh, or one less bad person. Not as bad person. Yeah. Lawful neutral still, could, yeah. <laughs> just not as bad. Yeah, it's an improvement. Uh, and our, our last slide here uh, shows off the uh, part of the displaced uh, capital of one of the new regions, New Sassalon, which came about in the Return of the Rune Lords adventure path. Uh, this is Eurythnia, the capital city of Bellamarius, the displaced Rune Lord of Envy. Uh, but she's not the only Rune Lord in the region. There's also Rune Lord Sorshin, who was the Rune Lord of Lust. Uh, and now there's two big, powerful wizards that are ruling this part of this region that suddenly. There's a lot more people here that showed up, uh, and we, you know, we also talk about things like the the rise of the Rune Lords Adventure Path. If you played with that, or Second Darkness, um, there, there's been just a lot that that went on here, and uh, I think it's probably one of our most touched on most touched regions. regions. So that that's a place that if you're used to, if you've played some of our IPs, you'll probably see a lot of the changes here. Um, and finally, we go on to the Shining Kingdoms, which which is that's one of my favorite pieces of art in this entire book. That's so cool. The Shining Kingdoms is our just standard knights in shining armor fantasy kind of region, but everything, of course, has a twist. There's uh, the place where the knights in shining armor, it turns out no one liked them, and suddenly it's been rebellion for 60 years at this point somehow. Uh, yeah, somehow. <laughs> uh, guillotines left and right, and people marching. Soul trapping guillotines. Soul trapping guillotines. People marching in the streets only to find that the guillotine catches them. Uh, so this is a, a region where we have the nations of Taldor, uh, Ander, and Galt, the land of the elves Kionin, the land of the dwarves, Five Kings Mountains, and Druma. And we haven't done too much here beyond the, one of our most recent adventure paths, the War for the Crown adventure path in Taldor, where uh, if we want to hop to our next slide here, Intrigue is uh, king in Taldor. Uh, this is a place where you have balls and nobles, uh, noble courts and things like that. And in that AP, the uh, potential ruler was uh, the daughter of the Grand Prince Stavian, uh, his daughter Eutropia, who you help out with uh, having her placed onto the throne, and now she is the Grand Princess, uh, the, the Empress of the land. Uh, and that's how things will fare for Taldor, we'll see here. This yet, but we've also made other changes. Andoran is a place where democracy is the the rule of the land, and there's been elections, and now we have new a new supreme elect in in Andira Murasek, who was a former Eagle Knight, and lots of other changes going on here. Uh, but if you want your typical fantasy, you can come here and go to the, our next slide and hit places like Kionin, uh, where they have the Elf Gates, the Iodara. And travel to distant lands and, and see pretty much anything from here. So that's our ugh, rough recap of trying to hit the entire <laughs> inner sea region. I think we buy your book. <laughs> yes, you're gonna have to buy it to see most of the changes. But does anyone have any questions on what may have changed or specific areas? Thank you. <laughs> Let's answer quickly. It's too long. Yes, we, we're going to try to get through these quickly. There's 10 regions. It's a lot to talk through. <laughs> Can I ask about not the inner sea region? Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, Nocticula. Uh-huh. Um, with her ascension, redemption, whatever, yes. um, her holy symbol has the icon of the moon, and she's had some connections with the moon scar, and then there's the um, Midnight Isles and mm -hmm. Lushnir and all that. Um What's happened with the Midnight Isles? How is she still connected with the Moon Scar? And yeah, that. Last I heard about the Midnight Isles, they are now up for grabs. So any demon lord who's like, oh, that looks like prime real estate, I'm going to take that for myself. Yes, she has ditched the Midnight Isles. She has a new domain in the Maelstrom. I think it's the Maelstrom. Yeah, I believe so. It's either the Maelstrom or like the very lowest end of Elysium, but uh, yeah, it's up for grabs, and there's probably going to be a lot of murder over it. But they're demons, so eh. yeah, we haven't put anything into print yet. But the most likely candidate to take over would probably be Shamira. Uh, as for the Moonscar, I think I remember James Jacobs, who that's his baby. The Nocticula storyline was his 
doing entirely. But I think he he believes that Nocticula sees the people on the moon scars as kind of a they're not really they they they're not I'm not with them. So <laughs> kind of throwing them on, under the bus. Yeah. So we can't have a Galarian plan without asking how did Aridin die? Oh, that was part of the secrets of the Galarian. Ah. Oh yeah, and we're never gonna. So tell. besides that, we saw Cassandly, Rose. What other deep changes have happened with the deities then? Hmm. Um, we have. Oh, well, I mean, Nocticula is one of those who ascended and That's probably the biggest. became a new deity, and Cassandly was the other one. Uh, I, there's one of a, the other books coming down the line here, World Guide number three, The Lost Omens, well, uh, Gods and Magic, which is coming out in January. Uh, we discuss a lot of the existing deities, and you know, we cover the 20 core deities, but we also start shifting gears on who are the other deities that we start focusing on. We, we used to focus on X, Y, and Z, but now we have new deities. We have one that's actually come over from Arcadia, uh, who is Kazutal. Uh, we have other deities from Tian Sha that we focus on. So, so not every adventure path ended with a new deity ascending, but who we, we talk about, who we discuss more so nowadays has changed, partially because you know, we have different tastes of who we would like to see in the books. Uh, and just we finally had a chance to talk about other deities, and now that we have information on them, we want to share that. So we talk about like our Gnomish deity, uh, maybe Rambodazzle, and our, one of our other halfling deities, which is uh, Chaldea. Uh, so, you know, it's not like there was any sort of like, you know, god hierarchy change up there. It's just that we're focusing more on the worshippers and how that faith has spread through different regions. Yeah. Like you mentioned uh, the Arcadian deity, uh, Kazutal, um, with there has been a, a small amount of cross-continent traffic and in that um, some Arcadians have brought their faith to certain areas of um, Absalom. Yeah, like Absalom and Ravenel. Uh, Why did Sorshin suddenly decide she wanted to be a not bad person? Was she uh, actually conscious for that 10,000 years in the Eye of Desire and just got really tired of being evil and lascivious and, and hedonistic? Or We haven't really stated one way or another, but one of the major points was that she uh, watched all of her other rune lords uh, stay evil and they all died except for Bellamarius, who was beaten up and not killed. And Sorshin decided that that was a mugs game, and she was, you know, not going to attract adventurers. And the best way to do that is to not be evil and do evil things. And whatever your personal morality is, if you just don't do anything evil, your, your alignment is going to sort of hover up a little that way for a while. Um, what she might do in the future, whether she's going to stick with it. Um, certainly she has decided that, you know, she likes the cut of Nocticula's jib and they probably will continually reinforce each other to stay uh, somewhere above the adventurer borderline. <laughs> Um, so uh, a couple hundred hours playing Kingmaker uh, <laughs> really nailed down that Brevoy was in uh, like a political turmoil. Yes. Has there been any major developments you can tell us oh, about? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we were just about to let things play out and resolve and be nice and happy, and we couldn't have that. So we <laughs> shook things up again. Uh, there was uh, about to be a wedding. I forget all the players involved, but there was about to be a wedding that was going to solve everything and make everything hunky-dory, and suddenly... The groom doesn't show up and is missing. And yeah, well, uh, it was uh, so there was going to be a marriage between the king and the Levada family, and theoretically that would unite all the warring things. And then the king's sister uh, accused the bride's brother of treason, and then he disappeared, and no one knows where he's at, and everybody's really mad. And yeah, yeah, I mean, no, there's some diplomats given some really heroic efforts in there, but they, there may be a war. It depends on whether we actually get around to it in an adventure path, but you know, maybe, it's a mess there. Maybe if Coral the Conqueror comes back, he can unite things. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from Kinjia hey. What inspired the creation of the world of Galarian? Ooh, that's I'm, that's a I James a Jacobs that. question. <laughs> that's well before all of our time. Um, I knew, 
Mm-hmm. I know that primarily uh, the world of Galarian was created by James Jacobs, Jason Bullman, Wes Schneider, Sutter. and James Sutter. And Mona. And Eric Mona. Um, a lot of elements, like a lot, lot of elements of it come from James Jacobs' um, old home campaign. home campaign from whenever he was in college. So a lot of the details of that, you should probably ask James or Eric or Wes. I, I, the, the gist of it is they all like different stuff and they all wanted to put it into the setting and it just happened to be that they found a, a niche to put that in. Yeah. yeah so. uh, I wanted to ask you guys, um, what do you think were like the easiest adventure paths? The kind of guys you guys just kind of came together and it was fine and easy. And which one was the most contentious? Which one kind of caused the most like back and forth, oh, deciding kind of how it would affect the future? Uh, some of those were really easy because we actually did say what they were, like Rise of the Moon Lords and Shattered Star were already dictated by the time Return of the Moon Lords came out, so okay, we got to go with those answers already. Uh, I don't think there was much contention. Yeah, I'd say most of them were easy because like, one thing that we didn't want to do is um, to talk about failures, um, which you know might make a fun narrative, but it could be very unsatisfying for someone who put in a lot of time in playing an adventure path and have the setting say like, Oh, you won in your home game? No, you didn't. That just, it wouldn't be satisfying. Yeah, and a lot of these answers that we had to come up with were very high-level answers, like, who is the new ruler of Erison? Okay, that's the only question we really need to answer. Right. Other things like, who are the new uh, writers for, for Baba Yaga? We haven't answered yet, and that might actually be the, the points where we start getting into contention about the finer details of things, when the time comes that we have to answer those questions. So. I think it was a pretty yeah. simple process. Yeah, I think a lot of the, out- the outcomes were obvious. Does this book cover any of the um, advancement of the planar politics? Uh, no. Or is it, that it, saved it, for something later? Yeah, it stays mostly for in the, the material plane. Energy region. Yeah. Do that. So uh, in the bestiary that y'all just released, it yeah. talks about how the Aeons have come out and said, well, we're actually lawful neutral and the inevitables were always kind of on our side and, you know, there's that mm-hmm. whole upshake there. Abadar has always been associated with inevitables. Did he know any of that or how is he reacting to that or how is hers, his worshippers on Galarian handling that? Abadar has always struck me as the sort of person who doesn't much care what's going on as long as you fill out the correct paperwork. <laughs> Uh, a lot of these changes, I mean, specifically planar stuff like that, happens on such a scale that to the people of Galarian, they might not even be aware that this shift has happened yet, and the shift for the Aeons and the Inevitables might have been going on for thousands of years and is still pro- you know, in progress right. to a degree. Uh, so what looks to be a sudden change has actually been going on for so long. Uh, and. You know, it, it's it's hard to gauge that kind of stuff. You might go your entire lifetime without realizing that someone has shifted the slightest degree towards lawful neutral in that. So, I mean, eventually they'll know by the time, you know, thousands of years from now, maybe people will finally recognize it. We'll, we'll see. I have a question from Strayu. When determining the results of APs for Lost Omens, mm-hmm. did events in one AP influence the results from another AP? I mean, there was the things like Rise of the Rune Lords and Shattered Star, yeah. Uh, most of the APs kind of were independent of each other. Right. So it was, none of that really happened. They're, what we're finding out now, though, is as we're exploring the world as it is now into the future, that seems to be influencing what we might be doing with the APs as we go forward. There are new individuals and characters in, in the world that are the new movers and shakers that have entire AP potential in each of them. So that's where we will probably start seeing things influencing each other. So this is the jumping off point for suddenly a dozen new APs, hopefully in the future. Were there any story elements that faced challenges due to the addition changeover? Like the gods being more restrictive on their clerics or, hey, a goblin walks into my shop to buy equipment and I don't chase him out? Um, only in the fact that we can't put 10 years of rules into a 140-page book uh, or into any of the, our setting stuff. I mean, we're, we're going to be talking about things that we had already established in the setting that we don't have rules. We knew that going into it. But also, um, if those of you have looked through your core rule book, we've got a lot of – we've got – a ton more setting in the rules than we ever did before. And a lot of that was um, we worked closely with the design team and it was just like, 
one thing we, and this was years ago when second edition was being started, it was like, we need to be able to tell the same stories and we need the rules to not completely invalidate something. Just because a rule doesn't exist yet, doesn't mean it's invalidated stuff. But if like all of a sudden, you know, angels, all angels breathed fire, you'd be like, ah, that's a little dumb because we've never said that before. Um, so the Council of Thieves of Venturepath completely blanking on the same name of the city that it's set West in. Crown. West Crown. Is West Crown independent? And if so, is uh -huh. Chelyax? No? No, no. West Crown is actually also involved in the Hell's Vengeance AP. That's where the Glorious Reclamation kind of took, took over and failed because the PCs <laughs> won. Uh, that, that's the evil PCs, but they won. And now West Crown is kind of a hotbed for rebellion and people who had the taste of Oh well, the glorious reclamation here was here for a little while, and I think it's kind of all right. Maybe we want that back. This this house through and maybe isn't the best way to go. So and they saw what Ravenel was up to. So yeah, we'll we'll see what happens with that in the future. Um, I want to ask about the uh, Technic League a little bit, or whatever's <laughs> left of them at this point. Um, if they are such in decline, is there anything stopping adventurers from just coming into and plundering a bunch of technology and bringing it kind of surrounding areas in Avistan? Uh, so what happened when the Technic League dissolved is they didn't really just like leave all the stuff they uh, had behind. They took it and they split up and they found other warlords and was like, hey, want a nuke? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> um, so now you have like a bunch of rival warlords with uh, technology that maybe they weren't responsible enough to really have their hands on. But it does still mean that most of the technology is still in the hands of Numerians in the Technic League. That being said, some of it did leak out to Ustalov, and uh, the Ustalov people did some weird things with it, you know, maybe setting up lightning bolt catching things and screaming, it's alive at uh, bad times of night. Uh, yeah, um, so it hasn't moved that far past, but some of it has, like, escaped. That said, if you just want to march into Numeria and get a laser pistol, you are probably going to have to fight a robot scorpion for it. It. Yep. All right. I think that's it for time here. So seems about. Thank you, everyone, yep. for coming by. Thanks for stopping by, and thanks, Twitch. <laughs>